Welcome everybody to Cinematic Conversations. It's 7.30 in the Central Time Zone. We do this every Wednesday. And if you found your way here, use the same link. We'll be doing this each week at 7.30. Uh, tonight, we're talking about this incredibly wonderful film called Rumble. And tonight's film is something that uh, really uh, Raquel Chapa put together this incredible panel of people talking about this film. And we have a lot of people here to uh, that are we're going to talk about the film with. But you know, Stevie, let me start with you. Where did Stevie go? Oh, there you are. You got a phone in front. I was trying to post on this thing. I don't know uh, what it is and where I'm at. I'm lost completely. <laughs> so Juliana just Juliana's I, like, I do this thing. Come and help me. I'm like, okay, okay. I just tagged you on Facebook, so <laughs> hopefully. Okay. Not. Sorry for the interruption. Part. Um, so, um, so, Stevie, do you want to talk about, you, you are executive producer on this film, is that correct? Yeah. So well, do you want to just start about like how this idea for this film happened and it was put together and it, it's done really well. I mean, it, it's really has a, you know, it, this was not done on the cheap. This was a good, this is a good film. Thank you. It was a hard film to make. Um, what happened was, um, I, I spent my life in the music business. Uh, for any of you who don't know me, and I and I and I did I did okay, and I had a good time. And um, I always used to go back to Indian country. Randy Castillo, the drummer of Ozzy Osbourne, met me when I was really young, right after my Rod Stewart tour, when I a few years out of high school. And he and he kind of friended me and took me under his wing and. He realized I was going bonkers, so he said, I need to take you to Indian country. And I grew up, my parents had left New Mexico. I grew up on the beach surfing in San Diego. And I knew who I was as a human being, but I'd never been, never even heard the phrase Indian country. And so we jumped on a plane and we went to New Mexico and he took me up to Taos. And it started something ritual for me where I spent all my time, whenever I'd go too far and too crazy and too whatever, I'd always go back and see the boys in Taos and I'd hang out in the country and I'd kind of get grounded. So in the 2000s, um, I was already, you know, my career was almost over in a way. And um, I was up opening for the Rolling Stones in Canada. And um, I met a guy called Brian Wright McLeod, an indigenous writer who was making a book, an encyclopedia about every bit of recorded music by any indigenous Native American um, in so going back to 1908 in Grass Cylinders. And he really wanted to interview me because I'd sold a few million albums and played with a lot of famous people like the Mick Jagger and all those guys. And I said, sure. And he turned me on to real details about Jesse Ed Davis and about Link Ray and really got me thinking. Um, I started to feel like, okay, I'm, I've had a really good life. I need to give something back. I wanted uh, indigenous people to know that they had role models that were current and not from 200 years ago. And I thought maybe, you know, what can I do? I can make a coffee book or something to, to, to talk about these amazing musicians that everyone loves and, and, and sh sh you know, make something for, Native, for, for my Native American friends to, to be proud of. And um, it turned out, I met a guy called Tim Johnson. We were opening a recording studio um, where Gerald knows the spot on Six Nations. And mm -hmm. uh, Tim Johnson lives on Six Nations and he was at the time the, the head of the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. And I gave a speech and I, and I gave a speech about traveling around the world and seeing how Native American people were worshiped in, in, around the world by people. And I didn't think anyone back home knew that. And I said, so when I'd be back home, someone would say to me, you know, how do we get one guy on Jay Leno? How did you do that? And I said, that's not the way you want to do it. You want to bring, you don't want to get one native into the mainstream. I go, you want to bring the mainstream to the natives. And Tim Johnson thought that was a brilliant concept. So he asked me to visit him in DC. I went down to the museum and I told him of Link Ray, Jesse Ed Davis, you know, Buffy and Robbie. And, and he just went bananas. He says, let's create an exhibit about this. So he, I took a job at the Smithsonian and we created an exhibit at uh, the National Museum of the American Indian called um, up where we will, up where we belong, natives and popular culture, and um, I wanted to call it Rumble, but it was way too wild for the museum. And um, it was supposed to be a three-month run and just a little run merit. It was supposed to show here's some native people who've done really well. And what happened was, it became the most popular exhibit they ever had. It extended another six months, 
Um, and then we moved it to New York and it ran for a year and made it four times bigger. And it ended up changing written history as we knew it. And that was complete. We didn't know that was going to happen. And then, so after that run, I said, I got to make a movie. And then I went about meeting with producers and I didn't know Julianne at the time. I probably would have did it with her. And, um, I, um, I made a movie and again, we made a movie for PBS trying to show indigenous people. They had this amazing these amazing people that they could really look up to that were role models that had proved that anything was possible. And again, the movie became gigantic. It became like a global, like we were in Australia and, you know, in, in France and England and Hungary and, and sold out everywhere. And um, so it was, an, it was an accident. It's become, now it's being taught in high schools and colleges across America. It's, it's actually a history course now in a school curriculum, which is just bananas. So um, thank you for, for going through the history and it's really kind of important. Um, before we get into other people, because you're the person who can answer this, one of the great things about this film, aside from all the great characters in there, is you have all these other people in there, you know, Martin Scorsese, super, you, you have- Super famous people. It, super it's, famous. Like, it's like every minute you watch the film, there's another furry famous person from some other universe, some of them are musicians and God knows, how did you get all of those people? There's got to be stories about it. like you call up Martin Scorsese and what does he say and how do you get to them? And then you know what is it like to interview Martin Scorsese? Okay, well there's a there's a couple questions in there. One thing is this: I spent my life, like I said, in the music business, and when I said I was pretty good, pretty at a pretty high level, I was at the highest level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was working with the biggest artists in the history of rock and roll, um, and still do. Uh, and those guys were my friends. Most of them were my friends. And, you know, I, I, I call them and I'd say, hey, and when I would tell, like, say, Steven Tyler, I'd say, man, this story. And he would say, I love Jesse Ed Davis. Jesse Ed Davis was my favorite guitar player when I was a kid. And I just want you to say it on camera. And the reason that there's so many, now in Canada, they didn't want me to have all these famous people because they thought it was like, you're showboating and you're gloating and you're bragging. But I would said, if you make an indigenous or any kind of a race film, and, and, and I have a, a, a native guy say, Jesse Ed Davis was as good as Eric Clapton. Non-believers, non-native people are gonna say, oh, come on, bullshit. But if I have Eric Clapton say it, they're gonna say, maybe I better take information. Who is this Jesse Ed guy? So I thought it was super important to not make it a race film. If you, it wasn't about race, it was about heroes. And I had the most famous musicians in the world talking about their heroes. And therefore the information was never in dispute because what are you gonna tell Eric Clapton he's lying about his own feelings of Jesse Ed Davis? You, it's not gonna happen. So that's why it was super important to have super credible people that people, I watched, you know, these people, my, I listen to artists my whole life. If they're telling me this information, I'm gonna take it a little more seriously than if I tell you, and you don't know me from anybody, right? So that's why there were so many famous people in there. It wasn't, it was great to do it and it was really exciting. And it made more people watch the film, but the real reason was so people couldn't stay. All right, so Steve, Steve, I have one more question to ask you before we go to everybody else. In the film, during your story, you say, well, it was really crazy. I went to playing in a band in high school to playing with Rod Stewart. There was something that happened in between those two points. You want to just- Yeah. Yeah. You want to just fill us in? Because you're the only person who can do that, right? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I was living on the beach in, in, in Carl, Oceanside, California, and I had a really cool band. And I just realized that that band is going as far as it was going to go. And I wanted to take my chances. I got in my car, I moved to LA, and I, I lived in a closet. I'm not kidding. I lived in a walk-in closet at a friend's house for a few months. And I was, I was having the time of my life. Like, it was super fun. Um, except in a, in a walk-in closet, there's no window. So you have to set the alarm clock. I never know what time it is. <laughs> and... Um, I got, by April, it was 1985. And so by April, August of 1985, I was homeless. I got kicked out of that house. And I had met, made some friends and there's a guy in a band called the Plimsolls that I used to love. He, he was a friend of mine. He said, I could sleep on the recording studio, Baby O Recording Studio, which was a famous recording studio. And in turn, I would clean up, I'd lock up at night, I'd empty the trash, I'd go run errands. And then I'd sleep in the studio couch, whatever studio was available at night. I'd just go sleep on the couch. And, um, it was the most horrible summer of my life because every other summer I was on the beach surfing and my mom and dad's, um, but I wasn't, I didn't want to go home. And what happened was I'd go up to every rock star in the studio 
I remember I went up to the guys and kissed and they told me to go F myself. I said, hey, I play guitar. If you ever need a guitar player, they're like, who are you? You know, I'm not kidding. Them. It was brutal, but I didn't care. I was young. And finally, I went up to George Clinton from Parliament Funkadelic and I said, I play guitar. You know, if you ever need him. And he goes, oh, okay. That's all he said. And then at three o'clock in the morning, he woke me up and said, hey, you want to try some guitar on this thing? And I just did. And the next thing you know, I was playing with Parliament Funkadelic and George Clinton and Bootsy Collins. And then, and then I met this guy called Don Was through Bootsy Collins. And I, I produced a couple tracks and played on his album. And he was nobody yet to me. But then the album went number one. It was a song called Walk the Dinosaur that went to number one. And it was like, I'm on MTV 8,000 times a day. And, and I scored a movie called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure that nobody cared about. Mm-hmm. And it became the biggest movie of the, of, it's one of the biggest movies of all time. It's mm-hmm. built over a billion dollars. And I'm in the movie. I'm, I play all the crazy guitar at the end. You know, it's supposed to be George Carlin, but it's me. Oh. And, and, then, and then Rod Stewart called me. And, and <laughs> you know, audition. He went from the closet of somebody's house to Rod Stewart called him. Right. And, three, and there yeah, it three is. Years, three years, pretty much. It was LA, LA in New York. And back then, it was the kind of town that you had to know what night to be where. And you had to be, you had to know the right people. And you, you, you didn't go to a certain place on a Wednesday if everyone was there on a Tuesday. You had to know where to go. And you'd meet these people and you make friends. And, and I had skills. I had some skills and they needed to be honed. But when you surround yourself with great people, you get better a lot faster. And, and you, you never want to be the great guy in the room. You want to be the crappy guy in the room. And I always was the crappy guy in the room. But they liked me. And Rod liked me. And I just got lucky. And I got in this band with Rod Stewart. And it changed my life forever. You know, and, and that was that. Well, great, great, great story. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know what's great about it, really? That maybe the most important thing I ever did in my life was make this film rumble. And I never would have been able to make it if I wouldn't have those lucky breaks getting me and those things that all happened. It would never, rumble never would have happened. You know what I mean? And rumble was, it was an erased, that was erased history. There was no, no, that, that was, it was there, but it was never going to be, it was never going to be in a history book. And it was all, it's all now there. And it's like, people are like, how did we ever not have this history? Yeah. Um, Raquel, do you want to introduce some of our guests here? Uh, yes, before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, original people of this land, and uh, one of which is the Nomina. Um, and so, in no particular order, but because she is Nomina, uh, Juliana Branham, who uh, has worked on many films, including. Uh, we Shall Remain and several others. And I'm gonna ask her, or hopefully we'll hear later what her newest project is. I think she has some exciting news. Um, we have uh, Jody Voice, uh, who is here in um, Dallas and uh, works with the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and um, also the uh, American Indian Heritage Day. She was instrumental in the group that started that. And uh, lastly, and I, I can't do this man justice, his, uh, his uh, bio is about 10 pages long because <laughs> he's done so much, but Peter Jemison, who is an artist and has been in many films and um, uh, just been, uh, he, he's been in, in uh, art installations and York since the 70s when there were like no native artists or just paintings of Indians on horses. He, he's really a trailblazer. So, so honored to have you all here. Um, but I, uh, I, I'd like you all to introduce yourselves a little more since I'm the voice of God. I'm sorry, my, my internet keeps uh, going down. So Julianne, do you want to tell us a little more about yourself and also about like from a, for, as a filmmaker, how did you look at this film? What did you see about, you know, the, the sort of scope of this film? And, and, and one other question I want to ask all of you, of all the people you saw on this, which is your favorite? Well, that's an easy one for me, but um, <laughs> I'll start with the first question. Um, so I'm a producer um, and director documentary filmmaker, um, uh, I'm Comanche, as uh, Rocky said, and um, I have been working uh, as a filmmaker now for about 15 years, and um, uh, more recently, I produced a documentary that was on Independent Lens this past, uh, this past, past uh, fall, this, this fall, um, called Conscience Point. And that's about um, the history of the Shinnecock Nation up in the Hamptons. 
and um, that was directed by Trevor Wormfeld. And then previous to that, I um, was a series producer on the PBS series Native America, which featured uh, Pete Jemison. <laughs> um, uh, and that's probably the project I am most proud of personally. Um, it just was epic in scale and, and it was just so, I just felt so well done. PBS really does it right because they give you the time and the money to, to take it seriously, to take your subject matter and give, and give them the, um, you know, all the attention that they deserve. So um, it's actually streaming for free right now on Amazon Prime. <laughs> so uh, check it out if you can, it's a four part series. But, um, but yeah, so the first time I, um, I actually, I met Stevie before Rumble came out, but uh, we kind of got to know each other right around that time because we were both kind of doing the publicity tour of Rumble and Native America at the same time. So we've become friends. We both live here in Austin, Texas and um, but the first time I saw it was at the University of Oklahoma and um, seeing, seeing it in a theater with the sound cranked all the way up when you hear that Link Ray and Link Ray has always been one of my favorite musicians. And I was embarrassed to, to say that I didn't know that he was native. And um, so, you know, hearing those first, you know, the, the first, you know, uh, sounds of, of rumble, he just electrifies you, right? Um, and, uh, uh, it just, it just was, it, the, the whole, the whole film for me, I found it particularly, um, compelling for me for, as a filmmaker, um, in that, you know, just like Stevie was saying, these, these stories, it's, 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 we don't see enough of those heroes, especially contemporary heroes, um, uh, in native in indigenous communities. And there's so many of them and we, as filmmakers, I think a lot of people, we tend to, and, and even the viewers tend to really kind of gravitate towards what's um, um, th this kind of sad victimization of what's happened. And our history is very tragic history, but it's also, we have a very rich, beautiful, colorful history that needs to be celebrated. And I'm, I'm kind of more of the, I, I lean more towards into the positive stories and the uh, the, the enlightening ones and the ones that, you know, in, are inspiring and especially for the young people. So this one was all of that more. So absolutely really inspiring. And, and it's, I mean, I, you know, for most of the musicians in here, I did not know that they were native American. I, you know, I've listened to Jimi Hendrix for years and I just had no idea. Robbie Robertson, I had no idea. And, you know, rumble, everybody knows that song but nobody sort of makes that connection and weaving these all together and getting a tapestry of this, I think is really kind of, kind of amazing. So when we start with the, because you mentioned rumble and rumble is where the film starts. The, to me, what's really great about that section and it's a great way to start and the visuals in that section are really very powerful. You see them coming out and it really, and, and what Rumble the song does, and I think the film portrays really well, is an attitude. It's, it's both musically amazing in the way that it has that power chord and that sequence where it intercuts with um, Pete Townsend and talks about what the power of that was and what the influence was and what that means, because we all know what that was and where it came from that. But, but there's a defiant nature of that sound that is like essentially to society, like, fuck you, in a sense. It, it, it like there's something, and, and to start with that, it sets you out on this journey that this is evocative, it is powerful. I mean, those chords come through you and you feel it in a very evocative, powerful way. And I think as, as a way to start the film, it is just really, uh, to me, really wonderful. Jody, why don't you talk a little bit about what you do and you do so many really important things for, for the Native American community. And then also I wanna hear what your favorite other than rumble is, because you know, Juliana got rumble, so you all have to think harder. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, uh, my name is Jody Boyce Yellowfish. Um, I'm Muskogee Creek, Oglala, Lakota and Cherokee. You know, I was born and raised here in Dallas and I've always been um, active in my community. And I think something um, that's always connected me to music, especially rock music, you know, my, my 
since my father, you know, he to this day is still kind of. And um, you know, that me as a child, and it was always really empowering. And you know, and you know, I've been doing advocacy and activism since I was a teenager. And when you when you're an organizer, you do speaking constantly. And as as a native person, you're always asked to share your story. You know, you're, 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 it's inherent that we're storytellers and, you know, and that's something that comes through, through music, you know, so I was always connected to, to the, to, to this type of music. And um, I, I wanted to mention too, that I was fortunate enough to see uh, the exhibit when it was at the um, National, the National Museum in DC. Um, and I hadn't heard about it. And I just happened to be there. Um, you know, I went to Haskell Indian Nations University, um, and there was a there's a, pro a professor, you know, Dr. Wildcat. He had a hand and heard his hand in a lot of climate change work. Um, and there was something going on there that um, a, one of my best friends, Sharina, she's on tonight. Um, <laughs> we got to go and we were, you know, had this small little internship, um, and we have we were working this conference, and I happened to go by and I seen the what it was, what the exhibit was. And I still have the, um, it was guided. You know, you put the headphones on, you walk through, there was a sheet of paper. I still have the paper that um, from that exhibit, you know, cause I was just like, I was so excited. I could not wait to tell my family what I had seen. And um, my friend and I, we were there when there was an event happening and we got to meet um, some of the musicians. We met uh, Janie Hendrix that at that at that event and everything and we were I was just blown away I could not believe um what was going on and it was so exciting to see that um somebody people were putting effort to share this story um and in you know in my work now you know I'm you know I I champion for people to tell their stories and acknowledge that you know they're the expert on their existence and that's what we are you know the experts aren't always in academia they're the people that are, you know, on, on the grounds and, you know, the folks sleeping in the walk-in closets, you know, like those are the people that can tell these stories to the best of their ability and, you know, not only educate people on us, on who we are as a people, but, you know, they, they can ignite things in people, you know, when the story is, is shared correctly. And, you know, when this, this film came out, man, my family, like my extended family, my friends, we were just like, have you seen it? Can you see? It? I mean, it's my kids are are you know enthralled. They they took it from me two nights ago talking about they're gonna start a band now. <laughs> you know, it's like he's gonna play guitar. My daughter wants to do the hand drum. Um, yeah. these things, these stories, um, they're just rejuvenating and refreshing to so many, you know, generations of people. Well, Jordy, um, so in, in near the end of the film, it sort of gets to talk about activism. And, and, you know, you see all of, of, of the sort of political angle in that. Um, and, and then um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, all the stuff about Buffy St. Marie, which like I was aware of Buffy St. Marie and I was aware of her songs and, and, and the sort of political value of them, but I had no idea that, that, that you know, the record companies and the government was shutting her out. Um, and, and what is that from an activist point of view, what is sort of the role aside from storytelling that rock music has, this music has to help people feel and be different and, 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 and connect, and, you know, what does that mean to you? Yeah, um, to me, you know, like what, what's important about that to me is just the, the, the literal feeling that a person gets because once you can, not only hear a story, but you can feel it through music. You can, you know, I mean, you can feel things and you're you're pulled into a world that you weren't expected to be in before that. You know, just like if you attend a ceremony, you you attend powwow, you attend concerts, you're, you know, you're enveloped in these different emotions. You know, and some of the, the things that I loved about um about this movie was some of, you know, the things about how you know the drum was played like a guitar or the call and response or yeah. you know things because those are so important and you know those are things that not only are they in music and even film and theater you know this call and response is so important you know you're sharing breath you're sharing 
vibes and energy and these things are so important um to to not only share the story but to share the feeling and how you're supposed to be when you when you hear these things you know there's there's certain ways to do things and um these things just they go hand in hand with the world of advocacy and activism and you know not that it's just the storytelling but the act of the storytelling um it's a very healing it's a very healing thing to be heard and see people like you like in this film and in the exhibit you know those things are empowering in the self and can change generations of people yeah i love the thing about the guitar and how that is in this way like a drum and it, it, it sort of struck me before that part of it came is like how many of the people that are in here are guitarists i mean jimmy hendrick i mean that most of them are guitarists we have one drummer and but it's mostly guitarist and you know you would think and that really sort of explains that moment peter do you want to talk about your background a little bit and and what in this film really spoke to you in a special way sure uh now it's kind of swag wiggle on on the walk on the uh gun knows a death down nikki also gun on the gun nikki kanange in my language i give thanks that each and every one of you are well um, instead of Seneca, we refer to ourselves as the people of the Great Hill. And um, I have a name that comes from the clan that I belong to. I'm a member of the Heron clan. And the name they've given me is Gannonza Tetel. It refers to responsibilities I have in the ceremonial way of life. And uh, I manage a historic site known as Gananda Gan. It's in Victor, New York. It's the site of a 17th century the capital of the Seneca Nation in the 17th century. And uh, it's a historic site with 569 acres, a Seneca Art and Culture Center, um, a bark longhouse reconstructed in the style that our people lived in, and uh, a project where we produce uh, three products of using our traditional white corn. So that's just a little bit about what I do. Uh, I'm an artist, and I'm right now hot on doing a and a couple of different exhibits and getting my work ready for them. But here's the thing I want to blow your mind away with. In uh, 1969, or excuse me, 1967, I saw Jimi Hendrix live in New York City at what became known as the Fillmore East. That was the first time I saw him. The second time I saw Jimmy live was in Berkeley in about 1970. And um, of course, you know, Jimmy did the uh, American the national anthem on his guitar and and all of that kind of stuff. And I saw in Toronto, I saw the band in 1969. Of course, no idea that Robbie Robertson was, um, you know, native and, uh, but I was appreciating all of this music, you know, um, as a young man, I mean, you know, the sixties and seventies, like they say, if you can remember, if you were there, you probably can't remember a lot of what you experienced. But, um, you know, I, I, I really, of course, love that music. And, of course, I'm old enough to remember when Link Ray came out with that. With that. What is a mind blower about Link Ray is that's totally instrumental. There are no words. It's just instrumental. And, you know, like you say, that powerful song, powerful uh, uh, beat, you know, and that powerful, yeah, exactly, that, that playing. I mean, I wanted to ask uh, Stevie a question. Um, at one point, does Derek Miller actually uh, take on the, the persona of Link Ray uh, because you didn't have footage? Uh, I'm just curious if that was true. I think I heard that maybe from Tim Johnson or something. Stevie, you're, 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 you're muted. That's weird. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, it's Derek it's Derek in the very beginning of the movie. Yeah. So Tim Johnson had this book um, that I really loved the cover of. And it was a picture of a, maybe it was an Oklahoma Indian guy. They were recording his song. Uh, some nuns were, I think they were, uh, when an old gramophone and he was, you know, singing. And I thought, God, that would be the greatest co uh, way to start the film. And um, we thought, well, Derek Miller, Derek Miller was when I first time I ever saw Derek Miller play I was at a festival in Canada and he was on stage and and I go um, that guy's that guy is playing Link Ray he was playing a Link Ray song and I thought wow this was years ago 
And so I went backstage and I introduced myself and he kissed my hand. It was like awesome. I was like, wow, thanks, Derek. And we became really good friends. And, you know, I seen him, I started seeing him a lot on Six Nations. And, and um, he was a Link Ray, he was the one singing Link Ray's praises for years before we did the Smithsonian, uh, anything. So when we went to do the movie, um, we, he dressed up as the guy on the, um, that was Derek dressed up in traditional, I believe in traditional uh, Mohawk, his outfit, because the original version was a guy with a gigantic headdress. And, mm -hmm. um, and Derek's, he's lip syncing that part and then he gets up and then he, he transforms into Link Ray. Yeah. It was like, that's all Derek Miller. And that was all, yeah. that was all our co-director Fonz, uh, Fonz has created that whole thing. And that to me was so cool because there, and it was great for Derek because he's Link Ray, he worshiped Link Ray and he got to be Link Ray. And yeah. uh, that's all Derek Miller from Six Nations. But it's, a, it's a great way to start the movie. I mean, it really sets a, a tone and makes that transition visually, which I think is really kind of an important, you know, construct. We, we felt that Link Ray, we needed to get, he connected with the earth in such a way where it was like one step out of the earth the way he played the guitar and for me that was the cornerstone of the movie uh because he wasn't the earliest you know person but there was something about the the being the rebel being being unwanted being pushed away uh you know they 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 you know who gets a song banned from radio for its lyrical content when it has no lyrics right. you know what i mean so it's like i don't know he, he, he represented everything that I, that I felt, you know, was going on with, with uh, the history of the people. So Peter, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, so sure. since, since you are, have lived longest and experienced this universe from the beginning, there's a yeah. kind of interesting dichotomy between the bands that you didn't know, the people in bands you didn't know were native, and Redbone and um, yeah. Buffy St. Marie. And so what is the difference in your mind between like finding out later that they are culturally native or things that are like upfront, this is what it is. And you know, what, what, what's the difference in how you see them and value them? Well, like, especially with Robbie for some reason, because Robbie played with a really good band. I mean, all of those, People were really top musicians, and it would have been a mind blower if at that time he had come out and said he was Mohawk. I mean, I, I don't know <laughs> what I think it would have changed, but I do feel that I would have loved to have known that at that particular time when I myself was, you know, sort of just beginning my journey as a Native artist. Uh, Raquel mentioned that back in the 70s, Actually, I worked with a Lumbee man named Lloyd Oxendine, and we ran a gallery in Soho in the 70s. And this was like way ahead of even Soho becoming the art center that it would eventually become. And it was quite a struggle, you know, to, to get people to take Native artists seriously. And so, it, you know, it's all around that same time period um, when, you know, when Robbie is really making it with, with the band. And, and, you know, in, in New York at the same time, there was Native American Theater Ensemble and they got a really positive review in the New York Times. It was the, here comes the cultural, here comes the music and comes the art. And at the same time, this is the jumping off point for the taking over the Bureau of Indian Affairs, occupying Alcatraz, Longest Walk, you know, um, the takeover of Wounded Knee. I mean, all those kind of things are kind of coming along. So it's a renaissance really it's a it's a it's a mind-blowing and a in a huge move that um i lived you know and i guess i uh, it it would just add to it if it had if robbie had said he was mohawk at the time and of course like redbone i mean th those were really to see them on dick clark uh back in the day that was that was a mind blower too you know and and i like to in my films i make films I always like to go out with rock, whoever it is. You know, I, I like to get, whether it's a friend of mine or whoever I can get to take a, a real, real short clip of it. Um, I like to exit the film with that kind of, that kind of energy, that kind of sound. 
So Stevie, I'd like to ask you the same question is, do, do you know, what do you think of in terms of that dichotomy of, of musicians that are out there wearing that like Redbone did in a very kind of unique or, or Buffy who is like clearly, um, you know, playing that role. And, and uh, because it's, it's, it's hard, like Buffy got in trouble. She, 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 her work didn't get, get through and it's a hard decision to make. It's, it's a bit of a complex answer um, because in those times, I asked Robbie flat out one time, I said, when you went in an audition and playing guitar, did, did you say like, hey, man, I'm, you know, I'm a Mohawk. He says, no. He says, but it wasn't, he says, you didn't walk into a room, hi, I'm, I'm Bob Polanski, I'm Polish. He goes, it had nothing to do with that. He goes, I played guitar. And if you're a great guitar player, it was about the music. So that back then it was like, it, he, for him, that was not, it was about music first. And to tell you the truth, it was that way for me too. Rod Stewart never asked me or Mick Jagger never asked me what my family heritage was. Mm -hmm. They all knew. And if you look back at my career, when I was a kid, you'll, you'll, you'll look back and you'll notice I always had some bit of representation on in my own way. It wasn't part of my sales pitch, right? But with, 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 uh, with Robbie, you remember in the film, his mother told him when he was young, be proud of who you are, but be careful who you tell. And yeah. that had to stick with him. I guarantee you it did. So he acted like, no, we didn't do it, but I bet you that had something to do with it. And um, the guys in Redbone were another story. They were trying to find a way to make it. They were trying to find that hook in LA, trying a way to stand out. And, and it was Jimi Hendrix that said, you guys, are, you guys are native, why don't you do the Indian thing? Mm -hmm. And they were like, let's try it. Cause they were like trying all these different things, you know? And, and, and then when they became who they were, but it didn't work because they were dressed like Indians. That might've been a gimmick for a minute. It worked because they wrote amazing, amazing songs. Those songs are- Good hook. And it's all music first. Really what Robbie said was correct, right? Yeah. Um, in, indeed, but when they would get up and wear that dress and do the dance, it really, I think was a very aggressive move. Oh, yeah. It was great showmanship and it was a great moment, but also in terms of cultural identity. I mean, it's always a big deal when you're watching TV and you see somebody who looks like you on television, no matter yeah. what you're coming from, there's a moment of breaking through in cultural identity that resonates and inspires people. And I think that that's why, you know, it's, it's good to have somebody like wearing that on their sleeve as opposed to it's there, but, you know, not seen it, but, you know, not every musician at every point can do that. It's like, you know, it's, you can, you have to sort of get your space and, you know, so yeah, it's, it's something well, that we all have to deal with. Yeah. Let me, I'll comment on that a bit because in the sixties and seventies, it was different, you know, um, now I find that people want to share their, who they are and they know that other people, I, now I know that when someone would see me on David Letterman or something, they'd be like, wow, that's a big deal. Maybe, you know, that's one guy who did it. And I never really knew that. And I don't think that when Redbone did it, they, they thought of, they, they were thinking about how to make it. But when they told me, Pat told me, Pat Vegas said to me, when they would get up there and they would dress like that, they would start to channel this energy that, that made them feel so powerful and they would do those dances and they would see them blowing people's minds away because that was something those people never seen before and you know on a big rock and roll stage so then it changed for them it became like this thing where they became very powerful for it but in the beginning they were just searching for a way to try to get their music out and and it's funny how the world works and the gods work and it just you know they were put into that position and that position changed everything and um, uh, that they did tell me that once they had done it and once it, they were up on that stage, it changed them inside. They felt us pride and power that maybe they weren't thinking about before. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of sense of spirituality that sort of comes in at the end and sort of connecting to the land, going back to New Mexico as a way of sort of countering the rock and roll, drinking drugs and other kinds of things. and you know, which if we're talking about rock and roll, rock and roll has a lifestyle, but there's also something coming from a Native American background that connects you to something different or can or should. 
Yeah, for me, it was finding balance. Um, my friends on Taos and my friends in New Mexico and Randy Castillo, Randy Castillo was the drummer of Ozzy Osbourne. He was from his, he was Leto Pueblo, but he was from, he was, he was the rock and roll rock God. And we did all the rock and roll fun things that you want to do, any kid wants to do. But we also had this way of coming back to earth and, and finding a balance to keep you from dying, you know, or going too far. And, um, and it was super important because all my friends in Taos that I hung out with, Benito and Carpio and all the boys up there, they were all fun, crazy guys, but they always, they always had a thing where you knew how to bring you back there to, to being a real human being. And you didn't find that in Los Angeles or New York City, I can tell you that. No, you definitely didn't. You know, and I also wanted to mention um, the 50s and the 60s, especially Indians were not cool. You know, we were like, mainly discriminated against and completely ignored and you know I'm living right down the road from uh, I mean I'm going to high school uh, two and a half miles away from where I grew up and you never heard the mention of Seneca period in any in any way in any you know context and um, it was just as though we weren't there except that you knew there was all kinds of discrimination around from the gas station to the you know, the guy that ran the donut shop to the people who uh, were teaching you, you know, that you lived with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, Juliana, do you want to introduce your cat there? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, won't, he won't leave me alone. So I just, we just got to just, this is Kalachi. <laughs> Sorry. Thank, thank, thank you for, for joining us. So, um, so since this film is made, and it's a couple of years old, has there been an influence for this? Have we seen a sort of resurgence of Native people picking up guitars and playing more music? And, and how, how, what's, what, what is the current state of, of, of this world? Can I, can I just tell you that I made this film for Native people and almost none of my Native friends have seen it yet. They all, oh, I got to see it. Meanwhile, it's been seen by, I've been to Australia three times. I've been to Europe 10 times where they've been all over the world with, I spoke at Notre Dame because it's being taught in the university. Oh. It's in San Diego state. I, I spoke the other day and most indigenous people have not got around to seeing it yet. And I'm like, I want them to see it. It's for free on Amazon prime. Now I hope that they see it because originally we just made this small film for PBS and independent lens and I made it for native people, but most of them I know haven't seen it yet. Yeah. So yeah. I'll, I'll tell you another good story. We were yeah. showing at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and it was just all of every color except no Native Americans. And all of a sudden this big Native American guy comes walking in and I'm like, yes, I got a guy here. I got one here. He sits down, he watches the film. At the end of the film, he comes up to me and he's crying. I mean, I'm not, a lot of people cried when they see this. A lot of my Native people that I knew would come to see them just start crying. He was crying, a grown giant, probably 50 year old, big, strong man. And I said, I go, I, I know the film's touching. I, what is it? He goes, he goes, I've never in my life. He goes, first of all, I didn't know anything about the film. I was walking by on the street and I saw a poster for it. So I just came in and to see it. Never knew anything about it. And he goes, I've never in my life seen any famous people say anything nice about any Indian in my life. And it was, he, he was crying. So, I mean, in that, I've had a lot of people say to me, all those famous people were saying such great things about us. And, and I never thought about how important that was, but it really is, it really is. And I just didn't know, you know, I just didn't know. So I would love to say I, my doing, but it wasn't, it was like, it's it just mind blowing to me. I wanted to mention to you, uh, Stevie, that in Rochester, a native audience did see it. It was shown at a place called the Little Theater Tim Johnson and I did a, a critique, well, you know, discussion of the film with the major uh, film critic here in Rochester who's since deceased, Jack Garner, but he was a, a great writer and he loved the film. But oh, there yeah. was definitely a native audience there to watch the film. Uh, great, Rocky. great. Yeah. I, want, I, want to, I want everyone to see it. And, and I hope, and it, so a lot of the young native musicians are starting to write me on uh, Instagram and stuff. And a lot of them, you know, d didn't know who I was. And, and I find that to be weird because I knew about every indigenous musician I could find when I was a kid. 
I just studied and looked and looked. And when I'd see someone out, I'd go up to him and want to talk to him. And um, I find that the, a lot of the young kids were just more uh, caught up in hip hop and, and uh, that lifestyle. And now I find that they're starting to see that the ones that seen Rumble write me and they're like, wow. And it's showing them that, that they can do their thing with their own style because everyone has their own thing. And, and indigenous people have this, definitely the movie shows that there's a, a, a mix where we can dance on both sides of the African-American side of music and the, and the white side of music. And we can dance right down the middle and make both sides sound better. And um, they know that. And so I hope that it just keeps growing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the section in New Orleans, which I found really fascinating? I mean, like, I just did not in my brain make that connection. Um, but once the, the film sort of does a very good job of, of, of sort of showing you, not just telling you. You didn't make a connection because we've been told our whole lives. We were told as kids, we watched a film made by the milk industry. The milk's what you need. So we would drink the milk. We were told Columbus discovered America. Hey, all right, he got, he's the guy. We were told all these things. So we just assumed, I always thought, that uh, the blues, the Delta blues in Mississippi was an African-American um, art form. I just right. assumed, because that's what I was always taught and told. We didn't know. One day, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top says to me, as a cell phone, he goes, come here, Stevie, look at this. And he shows me a picture of Charlie Patton. He goes, it's a black and white photo because it looks to me like he's got some wavy red blonde hair. And he was trying to tell me that he, everything was, I just always assumed he was an African-American. And once I really looked at the picture, he had, he had straight hair. He had straight kind of different hair. And he just, so we were brought up because you're conditioned to us to believe these things you're here over and over again your whole life. You then no longer see the evidence. I mean, I used to watch the, George Harrison from the Beatles Bangladesh concert all the time as a kid. And I always remember seeing Ringo Starr on drums and, and I always remember seeing Eric Clapton on guitar. And I always remember seeing uh, Klaus Berman on bass, you know, and all these guys. And I never saw the six foot gigantic Kiowa Indian st standing right next to George Harrison in buckskin. I never saw him. And how do you not see him? Because now when I watch it, he's bigger than life and he's right there. It's George Harrison from the Beatles, Eric Clapton and Jesse Ed Davis. I never saw him. So it was almost like they were invisible because we were told for so long that they didn't exist. But they were there all along. All we had to do was look. And that's something that Rumble opened up because once we started to look for this stuff, it was all there. It was always been there. It's just we didn't see it. Yeah. So uh, Juliana, can you tell me, so this is about music. What are the other areas where Native Americans are have a long tradition and have not been given credit or are unknown? Oh my gosh, everything from science to, um, uh, to food and cuisine to um, uh, you know ast uh, astronomy. Um, our people were, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries studying the stars. Um, environmental stewards. Um, we know more about this, these lands than, than anybody, period. <laughs> um, so there's a, so many, there are so many areas that we don't get a lot of credit for. Obviously, obviously um, in, in the arts, um, you know, right now our U.S. Poet Laureate, Laureate is Joy Harjo. Um, uh, who's just the most amazing writer, artist, poet. Um, you know, I think, I think now we're kind of going through this, um, another one of those renaissance where it becomes kind of, um, I, hate, I hate to say it, like in fashion, um, but it does, it does, they come in these waves where we're sort of forgotten and then right. something else kind of happens and we kind of get back into the, into the foray. And I think right now we're feeling that again, um, which is really great. And, um, you know, cause we just have so much to share and, and film, film is going really great now, I, I think. And there's a lot of doors opening up for native filmmakers. So that's really exciting. And the good thing is we have people like you who are in the position to do something, people like Stevie who are in a position to do something. We weren't there before, but now we've got people who can actually, you know, know the system, know how to work the system and how to make something happen. And, and that will make it stronger because more people become exposed to it. That's right. 
That's right. And Stevie and I, we're, we're brainstorming projects all the time. <laughs> so um, let me ask this, um, since we're talking about film and about this film, what about narrative films dealing with Native American stories? What is the sort of, you know, history legacy? Where is that at? That's a very good uh, time for that question because just um, what two weeks ago was announced that NBC is developing a project, the first uh, Native American drama on a national um, uh, primetime network wow. uh, in development right now. Um, and uh, with one of uh, Indian Country's great up and coming directors, well, I had to say she's up and coming, she's actually very established, uh, Sydney Freeland and writers. Um, and um, yeah, so we've got, and there's, you know, Res Dogs coming out, Sterling Harjo's Red Dog, Res Dogs um, on, I believe, uh, FX. Um, that's been shot. Um, lots of, lots of movies and, and dramas and, uh, you know, I think the narrative space is really, really exploding right now, which is exciting because before it's really just documentaries. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, I will say this, I, I think that a focus for me um, in, that, in those subjects, and I've talked to Julianne about this, is, is um, like I got to the point where when we started making Rumble, our director, uh, co-director, Catherine Bainbridge, she's married to a Cree guy and she has Cree kids. And, and, and she understandably wanted to touch on a lot of the the anger in uh, you know these things in in the film and, and they're there and I get it and and I didn't want to make another angry I didn't want to make an angry film I wanted to make a film about heroes not victims I didn't want to say you stole our music you stole our land you fucked us again I didn't want to do that I wanted to make a film about heroes and and you'd get all that stuff and I'm trying not, and all the things I do now, I'm trying to make great stories about great people and, and not victims. Not, I don't want to see another film, and I mean no disrespect to anyone. I don't want to see another film about the Holocaust. I don't want to see another film about it, Selma, Alabama. I get it. It was horrible. We all know. I don't want to tell I I'm Jewish. I don't want to see another film about the Holocaust. I, I've yeah. seen them since I was five years old. I've had enough. Bastante. So, uh, well, I hope when we get a platform, we can share the great things and the amazing things and the fun things. And, and you'll feel that pain in there because you can't escape it. It's there. But there's ways to do it where you, you feel it and you build an audience, not just take care of the believers that are already there, if you know what I'm saying. So Jody, I want to ask you, um, we're at this, we're getting near the end here. Um, and we're at this place politically where say the last four years have not been good to all of us, but people on native lands probably have had a very difficult you know, position where it's Trump trying to sell off a lot of the, the material. What can be done once there is a new administration on January 20th to sort of turn around some of the problems that pe Native people have faced during these four years? Um, so like one thing too is, is what we share about ourselves, like how Stevie was saying, like it was a story about heroes. And I think that's what makes it so emotional for people that watch it. Cause I know I cried the first time I see it. I cried, I was nervous thinking I might cry just talking about it this evening <laughs> because it's so, it's so, um, uplifting and you know i just i i was even just just messaging with a friend because you know i jumped at the chance when raquel asked if i wanted to to talk about this film and then but she she's like well if, if there's a documentary another documentary you want to talk about and i was like no i want to talk about this because i need it you know i need it you know my soul needs to be able to smile and laugh and embrace these these high points you know the peaks and not just the pits because we do, you know, when, especially dealing with like MMIW, I can be on my phone all night talking about how are we gonna save this person? You know, and that's our everyday and that's because of our history, you know, this colonized gender-based violence that we deal with on the, on the daily, you know? So we need to embrace these different, these different things like Stevie mentioned. And I think that's a part of um, 
how the organizing is going to be different with this um, with this new presidency. Um, you know, because you know, just the other day, you know, I was listening to Angela Davis speak on this 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 webinar, and you know, she said, you know, our biggest mistake was not organizing this way when Obama was in office, because it's not just who is sitting at that at that desk in the White House; it's everything around it. You know, I I try to organize around the city budget here because we need resources. We need mental health resources. We need food. We need safety. Um, so it's about your every day. It's not just about the presidency. It's about how you how you you're you're running your home and how you're not pandering to funders or exploiting your your historical trauma. You know, it's about looking forward as well, not just not just the pain, but looking for those heroes too and uplifting those stories as well. So I think that's something that that goes hand in hand when dealing with the pain and working towards change is not exploiting your 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 traumas. So so Jody, what is got coming up that maybe some people who are in Dallas could help with or know about or something that's going on that you could tell us about? Um so in Dallas, I mean there's there's constantly things going on. I mean we are looking for looking for things um funding constantly, looking for, for ways, you know, spaces, how do we help each other, you know, community care and collective care and healing. And, you know, um, before this pandemic, I don't think I've ever organized as much as I have before then, because it was so um, hyper-focused on my community as being Native. Um, and since this pandemic hit, you know, it's, we've, um, community after community, you know, we're more hand in hand because our struggles are on the same, you know, level, level plane now. Um, you know, we, we need the same funding, we need the same resources, we need health care. Um, you know, in Dallas, I just say like, you know, learn, learn, learn what district you live in, learn your council person, you know, find these, these organizations that are doing this groundwork. Um, you know, find, find art, find theater, find things to listen to and watch and, um, and kind of heal when you're doing that. I mean, I, I've never had the opportunity more than I have now to do things outside of organizing. You know, I'm I'm have the opportunity to do things um, like curating spaces where we can have healing circles and talk and learn how to own your own narrative and you know not pander to different things and heal and learn how to re to share responsibly. Um, and I think that's what. You know these films like these you know stevie and juliana like they're making these films that are teaching responsibility and you're sharing about the past and the present and what can happen in the future uh so juliana you want to talk us about what you thank you that was really great uh what you're working on right now uh well i'm actually um i've just uh gotten a de development grant from firelight media stanley oh Nelson. my god that is wonderful they're great people and Yes, they're really wonderful people to work with. And um, I am developing a documentary about the history of Black Indians um, and the, the unknown stories, the painful stories. We don't want to hear too much about what we're going to anyway. <laughs> and um, and uh, all the contemporary struggles and um, the um, whole movement right now of Afro-indigeneity and embracing that diaspora. Well, let us know how we can help you. Thank you. So Pete, that makes, what do you got, yeah. Karen? What do you got? You're next. Uh, okay, good, very good. <laughs> well, uh, I'm doing an exhibit in Buffalo as a brand new native art gallery opening in Buffalo in an area called Allentown, which is the art area of Buffalo. And it will open in December. It's owned by a Seneca man. And, uh, you know, he's really bringing a lot of sort of nationally known native artists to, the, to this uh, uh, exhibit as well as you know, looking at the Haudenosaunee artists that um, have begun to, to get some recognition. So I'm really pleased to be able to work with him. Um, so that's one aspect. But the, I wanted to comment on, I've never before heard the Native Americans mentioned as much as they were during this campaign and during this election, you know. Before this, we were like not even thought of, let alone mentioned. So now we've been mentioned, but just as the African-American is recognizing they've got to hold Joe Biden's feet to the fire, we have to too. We have to make sure that he is not just talking about us, but is actually taking 
the things that we are concerned about as a serious matter, whether it's the health concerns, whether it is the real treaty rights. If, you know, these bums, excuse me, who are quote unquote strict constitutionalists, if they were strict constitutionalists, they would remember that the constitution says treaties are the supreme law of the land. And so they would recognize that our treaties are meaningful. It's only Congress that has tried to obliviate and also to uh, abrogate virtually our treaties. But it's up to us to withhold and to, to stand up for them. That's what we're gonna have to do. All right, a call to arms and to keep everybody visual and, and that's a very important thing. Stevie, what are you working on next? Now that you're a filmmaker and uh, um, I'm sure you're working on a six picture deal for another series on Amazon, right? I'm, 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 tr I'm trying to. So, you know, if I, I need to get a big series if I want Juliana to work, she's super expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I have a, a, a new small production company uh, called Scene Red Six Nations on the Six Nations Res. And, and we're doing... Um, the same thing, like, I want to get out of documentaries. I like to do docs when, um, when I can, uh, because it's super important to get information out. But I also like making money, and, and, and a documentary is a pure heart and soul thing, man. You just, nobody's getting rich off documentaries. But, you know, those are the things that you have to do to learn. And so I'm developing, um, I'm working with the director of, of, the, of the film Maleficent, uh, Robert Stromberg, and a writer, a director named Kevin Monroe, who did the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and a bunch of other huge works with George Lucas. And we're doing a new uh, crime series uh, about a family of Native Americans. It's pretty interesting. We signed it with Blue Ant and we're getting ready to go start chopping it in the new year. Um, I'm producing a film with a, a writer director named Donick Carey right now. Donick is a 10 time no Emmy nominated uh, writer. He was the writer of David Letterman. He recently has a big film right now on Netflix called Have a Good Trip. And he um, was a showrunner, executive producer of The Simpsons for seven seasons and Parks and Recreation and um, uh, Silicon Valley. And we're doing a film, ironically, he, he, he came from Washington DC and his favorite team was the Washington football team. And him, him and his son used to sit every day and watch the, every Sunday and watch the games. And they had a, a room with all the memorabilia. And one day his 10 year old son says to him, hey dad, we love the team, but isn't it a racist name? And at that moment, he could no longer ignore it. And he, because he, he's, and it's, it's a, so it's a story about a white guy who loves everybody and is, and is a really good guy, he's a great guy, and is, and is kid. And he wants to teach his son in America about racism. So he goes on this journey and he's trying to do it without pissing everybody off because everyone's always so pissed. You got to do it right way, right? And so we're making a film about it. We're using humor and, and uh, animation and, 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 and bits like that to tell this story to try to take some of the rough edges off and uh, it's a pretty important film and it's a hard film um but we're in the middle of that right now and um uh what else we do? oh i have a short doc right now that's literally at doc new york nyc right now it, it debuted at tiff yeah. in september and it's at doc nyc this week which are two of the you know most important film festivals in, in the world and, and by the way and, since the 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 virus is going on anybody can see the films at doc nyc you don't have to be in new york which you I didn't know have to do oh, so see anybody here can go and and go to docnyc.com and and see the films but you go we'll go see my new film called the water walker it's it's a short doc uh and it's about a magic young lady named autumn pelter who's a uh, uh water protector and she speaks oh, yeah. in and then she speaks at uh, United Nations and, and she, she, she's, it's a magic little, we made it a magic kind of a story with, with Fifty Belcourt's artwork animated. And, and, and it's really about the fact that children now are the ones fighting for the environment. Uh, us grownups are all worried about our, our, our stock portfolios and all of our stuff. And these kids are like walking the streets and, and, and protesting and they're doing all of our dirty work for us. And we need to see this. And, and so it's a pretty important film. It's called The Water Walker. It's a great film. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much. We're actually five minutes over time. And I, I don't want to you know, overextend our welcome. Thank you so much to our guests, Peter, Joanna, Stevie. 
This has been a really wonderful discussion. Thank you to Raquel for putting this together. And um, Stevie, thank you for making this film. Um, it certainly uh, changed my view of music history. And I think it's been a real, uh, it's really great. So thank you all so much. Next week, we have another piece about music. It's uh, David Byrne's uh, American Utopia, which is on HBO Max. And we're going to have a dance critic and a film critic to talk about that. Manny Mendoza and um, God, who's the uh, Thor Christensen. Um, so that'll be a really interesting evening, 7.30 Central Time. And thank you all for coming.